We gather now to uh, close our time together in worship, and uh, after that there will be lunch provided downstairs. Once again, thanks to Peter Holmes and to all the members of uh, the New York Minster Park community for the wonderful hospitality that you've offered to all of us. So thank you and bless you all. Our uh, worship today will be led by Meg, and uh, she has asked us also to include a beautiful, beautiful poem that will sort of lead us into the singing of one of the hymns. Uh, when I read it, when she sent it to me, I was quite moved by it, and I'm sure that you will be as well. Uh, we'll also be helped in the leadership of this worship by Indra Naryansing, who is an elder at um, St. Andrew's Church, but also a lay preacher at her other home uh, and in, uh, the, on the island of Trinidad, so it's wonderful to have her with us. And Andy Klumpus is a great, great friend and, and um, participant in the community at St. Andrew's. And I believe it's true, did you help with breakfast this morning before you got here? Okay, okay. Andy uh, often helps with the, uh, the Tuesday morning breakfast at, uh, at St. Andrews, and it's not entirely a secret, he is um, pondering a call to ministry, and I thank all of you over the last couple of days for not entirely disabusing him of that notion. <laughs> How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard of Aaron. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Let us worship God, let us pray. Please pray with me. Sometimes we wonder why we need to say anything, Lord, because our faith teaches us that you already know all there is to know about us. Yet we feel the need to be met by you. Such meeting gives us a sense of assurance. It helps us to understand our smallness, our limitations, and grant us a fleeting glimpse of your majesty and glory through a hymn, a scripture, a prayer, an anthem, we seem to be drawn closer to the ultimate reality so that in moments like these, we can better understand ourselves in the presence of you, O oh Father. So we come to you today, God, in the midst of the crisis of our times and of our personal lives, asking, Lord, that you give us a clear view of your purpose for our lives the strength to live up to that vision, and the wisdom to live as those who have already won the victory through you. We need to be here today, O Heavenly Father, for it is only in your presence can we find our way and not stumble in the dark. Let the light come upon us even now as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The following reading is a letter to Lewis Smedes about God's presence by Roger Lama. I have to look in cracks and crevices. Don't tell me how God's mercy is as wide as the ocean, as deep as the sea. I already believe it, but that infinite prospect gets farther away the more we mouth it. I thank you for lamenting his absences from marriages going mad from the deaths of your son and mine, from the inescapable terrors of history, Treblinka, Vietnam, September the 11th. It's hard to celebrate his invisible presence in the sacrament while seeing his visible absence from the world. This must be why mystics and poets record the slender incursions of splintered light, echoes, fragments, odd words and phrases like flashes through darkened hallways. These stabs remind me that the proud and portly old church is really only that cut green slip grafted into a tiny nick that merciful God himself slit into the stem of his chosen Judah. The thin and tenuous thread we hang by, so astonishing, is the metaphor I need 
at the shoreline of all those immeasurable oceans of love. Let's rise and sing to God's praise, immortal, invisible, God only wise, number 676. Our scripture reading today is Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26, and you can find this on page 125 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. A reading from Acts. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. 
so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. And all the prophets, as many have spoken from Samuel to those, as, to those after him, also predicted these things. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, in your descendants all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Indra and Andrew are going to help me pass out something. So uh, instead of putting something into the offering basket, please take one out as it's passed through the pews. While they're doing that, if you know this song, don't leave me hanging, please. And if you don't know it, I think you'll pick it up fairly quickly. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. But what name? One of the quirks in the book of Acts is the way that they haven't figured out yet what the name is exactly. Blessed be which name? In verse 13, Peter uses the name Servant Jesus. And then in verse 14, Peter tries out Holy and Righteous One. In verse 15, Peter hearkens back to Jesus' own self-designation, I am the resurrection and the life, to refer to Jesus as the author of life whom God raised from the dead. The early church is still sorting out the details of the gospel with which they have been entrusted. Just exactly how are we going to explain Jesus? And who hasn't had that thought on a Monday morning in your study? They don't know yet his name, but they know that his name is important. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given us this complete healing. If you think about it, this is really only Peter's second sermon. So it makes sense that he's still figuring out how to say what needs to be said about God to these people in this moment. They may not know exactly which name will land, but they know that there is power in the name, power enough to terrify the religious authorities who have a vested interest in spiritual power in this place. When they question Peter and John, they want to know by what power, by what name do you do this? When the healing and subsequent inquisition in this story get started, Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. And that's important because, in other words, Peter is not standing outside of the group of people he is chastising. He is one of them. Biblical scholar Willie Jennings refers to this as an in-house conversation a family argument. 
Peter acknowledges that they don't know what they were doing, or more importantly, who they were doing it to when they handed Jesus over to be killed, disowned him before Pilate, and asked for Barabbas to be released instead. After a gut-punching litany of accusation, there is some grace in Peter's willingness to attribute this behavior to ignorance rather than malice. It is a small grace mirrored after a much larger grace, that of Jesus himself on the cross, who asked, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they are doing. And it is a grace being offered by one who is himself in need of grace. Consider the fact that Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion aren't high points in Jesus in, in Peter's biography either. He knows what it is to get some things wrong about Jesus. With the get me behind get thee behind me Satan exchange and his resistance to washed feet, and the denial, and the slinking off to huddle in an upper room, and so much confusion at the empty tomb. He carries his own failure into this confrontation as he speaks to his people about the sin that they hold in common. It's what we preachers do every Sunday when we dare to ascend the pulpit, carrying the failures of our week with us, that burst of impatience in staff meeting, the disappointment about that call that didn't come through, the discouragement about the state of the world or the state of our lives. We climb into our pulpits not to lambast them for everything they've gotten wrong, no matter how bad the vestry meeting was, or how little they want to actually make the changes necessary to keep the church from dying on your watch. We stand with our people and do what we are called to do. First, we speak about the sin we hold in common. This is white people talking to white people about how all lives matter doesn't cut it when black and indigenous lives are on the line. And it's Christians talking to Christians about the social, political, and economic allegiances that undermine our witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In-house conversations. Faithfulness in the form of family arguments. And at a more intimate level, it's what we pastors dare to do each week as we step into hospital rooms or homes, or sit by the bedsides of those that we are called to love. It is the work of figuring out how to name Jesus in this moment. In response to this need, this aching grief, or this joyful milestone, Does it still take our breath away that this is what we get to be called to do? Called to pay attention to the particular and peculiar presence of God in any given moment. Helping God's people to know Jesus in all of the familiar and unfamiliar places of their lives. We ask ourselves, what is this person waiting for the triune God to do? What facet of redemption is it that they need? What salvation joy is theirs? As pastors, we are vocationally trained and attuned to the work of naming Jesus in the lives of others. And in this text, Peter is thinking like a pastor. 
Peter embeds the story of Jesus in the history of the people he's speaking to. He gives them a way to find Jesus and name him in their context. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors. And this is in fact how God identifies God's presence to Moses, speaking from the burning bush in Exodus 3 so that when the people on Solomon's portico hear the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ears perk up because they know that story, and they know that name, and they know that God. And then, adds Peter, Jesus is the incarnation of God's covenant faithfulness the same faithfulness that called Abraham to a new land, that sustained Abraham as he waited for an heir. That same faithfulness is embodied in Jesus. Peter adds, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. And after embedding the story of Jesus in the history of the people that he is speaking to, Peter turns their attention from the past to the future. Jesus is now the promise of something new and something yet to come. Jesus is in heaven now, but he is coming again. And when he does, God will restore everything, everything as he promised long ago. Acts of healing and restoration, like the man made to walk again on the temple steps, are the beginnings and the foretastes and the hints of a new kingdom to come, a complete and total restoration. The creation will no longer groan under the floodwaters or break open along fault lines. People will be restored to one another and to God. There will be no wars between nations or petty disagreements among family members. There is a day coming when everything will be restored. With this sermon, Peter sets a pattern that will flow through the rest of the book of Acts and in our better moments, the trajectory of Christian history. A pattern in which followers of Jesus Christ are always looking for and finding ways to set the story of Jesus inside the stories of individuals and of cultures and of moments. Or perhaps better to say, finding the ways that God has already placed these stories within his promises. Peter does it here. The apostle Philip will find himself in the company of an Ethiopian royal official, and he'll ask if he can help the man understand what he is reading from the book of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit will descend upon the Gentiles and they will begin living as disciples of Jesus Christ and Peter and the other Jewish Christians are going to have to figure out how that works. Paul will eventually show up in Athens, complimenting the residents on their religious devotion, commenting on their altar to an unknown God and quoting the Athenians' own poets. Paul will offer the story of Jesus that is already embedded in the culture of Gentile Athens. And so friends, as I think about the work that we are returning to in the next day, the work of pastoral visits and sermon craft, the work of teaching, preaching, and writing books that will inspire a new generation of sermon crafters. It is all a continuation of this legacy all the way back to the temple steps in Jerusalem, where Peter dares to name Jesus. Whether we are returning emails or participating in vestry meeting, 
knocking on that hospital room door or planning the liturgy for next Sunday's service. This is the work we get to do. We get to know the story of Scripture, and then we get to pay attention to it as though it will still surprise us, and it does. We step into people's lives, and we get to pay attention to God's presence there, too. But... As we go back to the work of paying attention to naming God at work in the lives of others, I want to stop and wonder with you, what is God's name? What is God's attribute or action for you? What is it you are waiting for the triune God to do? What facet of redemption do you need? What salvation joy is yours today? Because naming the presence of God for others isn't the hardest part, y'all. Brace yourself. Because we are real, live human beings, We need God to be named for us and by us and with us too. And that is so much harder. After a conference like this one, I can imagine that many of us feel full. Hopefully pleasantly full, but also maybe a little bit of indigestion. What are we going to do with all that we've been given here? Can we name the ways that we have encountered or we have longed for or we have learned God's presence, character, or power over the past few days together? Can we stop and name it before we move on and get busy naming God for everyone else? This morning, each of us has a name tag and it's something to take home with you. I invite you either now or later today to ask the Spirit to help you name what God is doing or what you long for God to do in your life. Perhaps it is a challenge or a comfort you have received through the preaching or teaching here. Perhaps it is a need at home that has kept you up at night. Friends, in Christ, Jesus is named in so many ways in Scripture because Jesus redeems us in so many ways. And at the risk of ending this sermon with a list, Scott, (laughs) Jesus is Savior because we are sinners. Jesus is a suffering servant because we are victims. Jesus is Messiah because he fulfills old promises. Jesus is king because he is the new promise foretold. Jesus is life because we are scared to death of death. Jesus is great physician because our bodies are broken. Jesus is bread of life because we are hungry. Jesus is Lord because we've got to obey somebody. Jesus is wonderful counselor because we've all got issues. Jesus is alpha and omega because we can't hold it together. Jesus is reconciliation because we do not love our neighbors. Jesus is prince of peace because we like to make war. Jesus is liberator because we are trapped in addiction. Jesus is truth because we tell lies. Jesus is advocate because our voices are just too weak. Jesus is judge because our world has got to be set right. Jesus is cornerstone because what we build falls apart. Jesus is good shepherd because we are prone to wander. Jesus is Emmanuel because we are often alone. Jesus is light of the world because we both hide in and fear the darkness. 
Jesus is, and Jesus was, and Jesus is to come. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the names of the Lord. Blessed be the names, blessed be the names, blessed be the names of the Lord. Would you pray with me? God who loves us, there has been something so holy and healing about being with colleagues over the past two days opportunities to take down our guard, to learn together, to laugh and to be startled awake by your word. You have fed us well and richly here, as you are about to do again through the lunch tables and conversation. Thank you. God who saves us, there are so many ways that we need you. As we return to our homes, the chaos of domestic life or the empty echoes of loneliness may return. We have to contend with the realities of the lives we've been given, bodies that are sick, minds that are distracted, spirits that often flag, souls that so quickly run dry. Save us, Lord, in all of the ways that only you know how. God, who sends us, we offer the work of our hands to you, the precious privilege of the pulpit, the sacred trust of pastoral care, the challenging work of leading your people where they may not want to go. Guide us, keep us, corral us, free us. And God, would you be with us until we meet again. In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as we sing hymn 480, God be with you till we meet again. Hymn 480.
Friends, the good news is that we will meet again very shortly in the basement for lunch. Um, and so may God bless the food to our bodies and the conversation there to our souls. And after that, as we go back out into the world to see and name God's work among us, God goes before you to guide you. God goes beneath you to hold you up. God is behind you to protect you and above you to watch over you. And God is always right beside you to be your friend. Do not be afraid. The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with us now and forever. Amen.